this has been sustained through... Oh, it was Abu, Abu Bakr. Very good. Through Muslim history. I've been looking it up too, Rory. Very good. No, I, I haven't had to look it up for <laughs> once in my life. <laughs> what do you think you're going to vote, though? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I'm staying out of that at the moment. I'm, I'm sticking... Oh, well, you can't stay out of it. You're, you're secret, a political figure. Secrecy of the ballot. Normally, you and I would be talking about Macron, and we would be talking about Macron. Why are we not talking about Macron at the moment? Hello, and welcome to The Rest is Politics, Question Time, with me, Rory Stewart. And me, Alistair Campbell. And our first question this week is on something we briefly touched upon in the main podcast, that's India. Gabe Sutcliffe, what do you think about Modi building a Hindu temple on the site of a demolished mosque in India? Well, let's let's just sort of quickly give the background on this. So there was a very, very famous mosque called the Babri Masjid, which was built by the Emperor Babur, who was the first Mughal emperor of India. So it's the late 15th century, late 1400s, early 1500s, he, he took over in India. And it was believed by a particular group of Hindu nationalists to have been built on the site of the birthplace of Rama, the hero of the Ramayana. And in the early 90s, it was torn down by a Hindu nationalist mob. And then a huge amount of money has been plowed in, some of it coming from Narendra Modi's government, into building a vast Hindu temple on the site. And Narendra Modi has spent much of the last 40 days fasting, sleeping on the floor of a temple, been involved in religious purification rites, and has presided over an extraordinary star-studded reopening of this temple in Iodia with Bollywood stars and business people there as a very, very aggressive attack, basically, on, on Muslim identity and the Muslim community in India. And just to wind back on the, the, the 1992 situation when the mosque was kind of, you know, raised to the ground, that led to riots in which around 2,000 people, even more than 2,000 people, I think, were killed. And then a decade or so, so later, riots in Gujarat, where the then regional prime minister uh, Modi, Narendra Modi, was felt to be very, very biased towards one side, unfair to the Muslim community. I think there was a point where he couldn't travel um, to many parts of the world because he was essentially seen as as being quite extreme. He's now um, heading for another election. India is one in this great election year. India is one of the elections. It'll be in a few months' time. He gets to choose the date. Um, and this is this is a country that is supposedly secular. State and politics and religion are meant to be separate. And yet that was as powerful a political event as I think I've seen in a very, very long time. Um, he is shaping a new India, and he's, he's making no bones about that. He's shaping a new India up to and including possibly changing the name at some point. And the whole event really was a way of signaling, I'm your man, I'm, the, I'm, the, I'm, I'm for the Hindus. And that, of course, is 80% of the population. Um, and it was, you talk about, I mean, the Bollywood stars were there. Sachin Tendulkar is one of the greatest cricketers of all time. He was there. They built a new airport to go along with the town. They built a new railway station. It's a sort of, he's, he's bringing together the religion, massive investment in infrastructure, and him as this kind of man of the people, um, which is an act which the Indians seem to like. And, and to take it back to the real fundamentals, India under the British, had a huge mixed Hindu-Muslim population, along obviously with Parsi, Buddhist, Christians, and others, but predominantly Hindu and with a very large Muslim minority. And the partition that split India apart after independence in 1947 was essentially about the creation of a Muslim state in Pakistan, and India resisted that. India, in its constitution and under Nero, remained defiantly secular. Mm. We're very, very proud of the fact that when Pakistan decided to create a state around Muslim identity, India was not doing that. And under Congress and uh, Indira Gandhi, who was the, the daughter of Nehru, they kept this secular vision alive and, in fact, were frequently very, very firm against Hindu nationalists and others who tried to stir up Hindu-Muslim hatred. But the Babri Masjid and then the riots that followed and then the Gujarat riots 
made Muslims feel in India really as though they were becoming a marginalized, persecuted minority. The Gujarat riots produced footage of pregnant women being attacked and uh, rape happening and a lot of images, in fact, which are very, very reminiscent of the images that came out of the October 7th Hamas attack on Gaza and had the same impact, I think, on the Muslim community or many people in the Muslim community in India that the attacks on October 7th had on many Israelis and Jews, which is that it led to a strong sense that Islamophobia in India was now state-backed. And Modi famously, when asked whether he regretted what happened when he was chief minister, all this happening under his nose, said his only regret was he hadn't managed the media better. Mm. Um, so it's it's terrifying. There's a, there's a book by K.S. Comoretti, which called Malevolent Republic, which really makes the case against Modi's Hindu nationalism very, very strongly. Um, I mean, it's a bit of a polemic. So, but if you want to hear the case, the worst case made against what's happening now in India, Comrade's book is incredibly readable, and he's pretty brutal actually on Congress and on on the Gandhis as well. Yeah, it's um, he, he's a formidable politician. There's no doubt about that, um, and his you know the way he his his demeanour. He he, he he comes across as being so calm and quite gentle character, but he's a very, very, very tough politician. I really dodged a bullet not long after he was elected because I was asked if I would go and write his biography. Oh, my goodness. Um, oh, wait, do you yeah, remember you was, saying this? You were going to be his biographer. Wow. Yeah, and I was quite tempted. I, I can't remember what else I was doing at the time, but I was reasonably tempted. I thought, because I'd written about him in the book I wrote, Winners. I think this is what drew their attention to me as a possibility i'd written at some length about his campaign you know how i love the abba voyage yes uh, the, console the, the, these, the avatars. these avatars artificial yep, intelligence yep, yep. but modi was ahead of the game modi was doing rallies all around the country where he would be live in a say delhi and then around the country on the what was just the back of a lorry the the fake modi would come out and he was so he's gathering huge crowds he's a great showman but I think this is, you know, if you're, if you're, and 20% of the population, roughly 20% Muslim, that's a lot of people who are currently feeling a bit scared. And there was a guy, I don't know if you ever watched some of the Indian television, but I, I was sort of channel hopping through a couple of them yesterday. And they, you know, they get very, very enervated and very, very excited. And there was one guy who was on the news saying, you know, now we've got to take this to every town and every city and tear down the mosques. And then he was sort of waving a flag and saying, you know, including the Taj Mahal, the Taj Mahal must go. And you're thinking, you know, this is quite scary stuff. Um, in an and it's in an election year. I think there's no yeah. doubt. And as we discussed the in the podcast year. yesterday, it's easy to be complacent about this stuff. I mean, if you, because the Indian economy is going very well and business people like Modi and he's cleared up corruption and he sorted out the currency. And of course, India is very popular at the moment with the West because it's seen as the counterbalance to China. Yeah. And of course, Modi is very, very popular with the diaspora community. Um, people are reluctant to criticize him. So people will say, oh yeah, he's talking that stuff. And yes, he was involved in this Hindu extremist militia group in his youth, but really this is just chat and yeah. it's difficult to predict the future. But what we do know from Russia, particularly at the moment, that you can go down a pretty fast slippery slope from starting to get all this ethno-nationalist, or in this case, religious nationalist language going, can lead to some very, very sinister yeah. results pretty pretty quickly. Um, and it gets out of control of the leaders. I mean, you get the sense with Putin that it's, as you were talking about with that, that book um, by J.P. Glynn, it's not just Putin, it's the whole lot surrounding him. And again, it's true with Modi. I mean, Modi, of course, himself now has his own even more ultra-nationalist Hindu rights, saying he's not going far yeah, enough. Yeah. Now, Cameron Stocker, tactical voting. Considering Labour's massive poll lead, do you think tactical voting campaigns such as getvoting.org will still be important in the upcoming general election? In marginal seats, could the UK's broken first-past-the-post electoral system allow the choice to cling on? And at the, on that same sort of theme, Rory, I want to give a shout-out to something called South Devon Primary. Oh, yes. All I've done is sort of see it on social media and had a look at a, the odd website and stuff. But basically, they seem to be 
saying that so they're in an area south of devon that is traditionally you know fairly tory they say there's a clear majority that want the tories out and so what they're doing is going through this sort of primary process where they're having hustings with all the different opposition candidates and hoping eventually to end up with one and this is spreading to a few other seats as well so i don't know whether that will that will catch on whether that will work whether some people will feel no i have to vote for the party i want even if i think they're going to you know they're not necessarily going to lose but I think tactical voting will. I think there will be a lot of tactical voting. Yeah, and 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 it's and it's now enabled by technology much more, isn't it? That's what this this website getvoting.org does, isn't it? It helps you understand how you should be voting tactically. Just on this similar theme, what did you make of Hamza Youssef coming out at the weekend? And and the the message he seemed to be trying to put across was. Keir Starmer is definitely going to be the next prime minister. Therefore, I'd quite like to talk to him before that happens. And we can sort of, you know, work out whether we can work together. Well, is, I mean, is that not, I mean, presumably he's, his main objective is to make sure he wins as many seats as possible in the next election. So is it possible that he thinks that if people think that Keir Starmer's a shoe in in the way that they thought Theresa May was a shoe in in 2017, maybe people will vote SNP because they'll think they don't need the Labour votes in Scotland. Is that his hope? Yeah, but I, I think it probably is. But it, I just found it quite confusing because at, at various points, they've had all these different lines of a, approach as to why you should vote SNP. At one point, it was to say it's because there's going to be a Tory government. The Tories are going to win unless you vote SNP. Then it was going to be there's a hung parliament. Then they ran this line that there's no difference between Tory and Labour. Then they ran the line that the election is going to be a referendum on independence again. And so I'm just a bit, I was just a little bit confused. I'm, I'm guessing you're right that it's trying to, maybe the Tories and the SNP both have a vested interest in people thinking that the election is a foregone conclusion because that is then. In, 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 in Scotland, yeah. Well, no, but 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 in but England as well, you might have this sort of sense that there's, look, there's no point. We're going to lose. There's no point voting. Just you know, vote for us, but don't bother. But we're going to lose anyway. I mean, it's a sort of, it's a. I think it used to be called the Queensland strategy, where you basically, <laughs> and that, and that the reason for that was because the uh, a party ran that as a strategy, saying that you know we're going to lose. There's no point really getting involved. And of course, you know, they, they to, to quote your predecessor Willie Whitelaw in your old seat, they went around the country stirring up apathy, and it worked. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think that's what he's up to, but we'll be able, we'll be able to ask him when, um, when we see him. Question from James Moole. Gosh, muscles. Which three current world leaders would you most want Britain's next prime minister to look to for inspiration? <sighs> I'm not going with Narendra Modi, notwithstanding your book winners. No, no. no definitely not. I, I wrote about him as a winning campaign and not as a winning prime minister. <laughs> Very good. Um, Oh my God, that's a hard question. I think my friend Eddie Ram is good, uh, heading up for a fourth term, and oh, that's quite a thing right to direction. look at. The, look at the Prime Minister of Albania <laughs> as the inspiration. <laughs> I did, I did, I did, I did preface it with my friend. Um, I think the Prime Minister of Singapore, who's in his last year, I think he's a very, very impressive guy. But of course, Singaporean politics is very different to no, ours. Norm normally, you and I would be talking about Macron, wouldn't we? We'd be talking about Macron. Why are we not talking about Macron at the moment? Yeah, Macron. I think Macron has been good. Um, but, you know, he's he's also, I think we have to say, he's very, very unpopular in France at the moment. Yeah. But he, I think Macron, yeah, Macron is a sort of leader who's definitely kind of got a sense of vision and good at building teams and they may break up teams as well, but he builds them again. Oh yeah, there aren't that many, are there? I, I, I asked this question actually of um, one of the Congress people that we saw recently. I said, which other world leaders do you admire then? And she said, Millet. Millet. <laughs> In Argentina. So. Millet. Oh, Donald Tusk. I think a shout out for Donald Tusk. Who's, we've got some questions on Poland, but I think we should revisit Poland in some depth because he's come in and it's proving very, very hard to unpick and undo a lot of the damage that's been done by the, the PIS in recent years. But I would definitely say Donald Tusk. For Kasi, because there are still parts of the Law and Justice Party, including the president sitting there with their, their, their hands on class, important bits of power, right? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Another one I, th I would um, point to, I think has shown incredible courage, is the president of Moldova, Maya Sandu. I think she's you a know, very small country, very, very, very dangerously placed right now yep. with Russia breathing down their necks. And I think she's a very, very impressive woman. So there's somebody else maybe we should look to. Uh, uh, 
Why isn't rejoining the EU front and centre of Labour's campaign? What can say, well, given Alistair's schadenfreude on Brexit, why does he think Labour will not put rejoining the EU in their manifesto for the next election? Because they don't want to revisit the whole Brexit debate at this time when they're trying to win the election on, on other issues. I might not welcome that or even think that it's the right thing to do, but um, I think that's the answer to the question. Lewis Snader, how are the Lib Dems going to do in the election? They never seem to be discussed. Well, they are in a pretty sad situation. I mean, the Conservatives are a terrible situation. The latest polls put Labour, you know, pushing towards 50%, the Tories in the um, low 20s. But at the moment, the Lib Dems are neck and neck with the ex sort of Brexit UK, uh, UKIP party. Mm. And I don't think I've been, I, 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 you know, we've been discussing um, Ed Davey. He's not cutting through. I know you liked him when we interviewed him on the, on leading, but and I know we've got a lot of Lib Dem listeners, but boy, oh boy, I think would people struggle to work out what on earth his platform is. He's been the leader of that party for a surprisingly long time, and I am not seeing energy there. And the obvious thing they should be doing, relating to your last question, is coming out for customs union or coming out for the single market, putting the EU at the centre of the agenda. That at least would make them distinctive. Yeah. Can you think of anything they're saying that Labour's not saying or the Tories aren't saying? Well, I guess that what... What he would say, I imagine, is that they have a very, very targeted strategy aimed at a number of constituencies that they uh, are going for, most of which are currently held by the Tories. Um, but I agree that they're not really cutting through. In fact, I think that the way that he got placed at the centre of the post office scandal, for a lot of people, would have been their kind of first sense of him as a sort of national figure politician. And it is always harder for the third party, but it's even harder for him at the moment because he doesn't get the automatic platform in Parliament because he's not the third party anymore. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 you remember, I, I thought he'd been in that position for a long time. And when I asked him on leading, you'd go and tell us what you're about. I thought he was surprisingly slow to come up with a, a line. Mm, and I said, if you remember, I said, I bet they'll go away from that now and they'll, they'll really work it out and we'll start to see it. But I agree with you, we haven't really... We haven't really seen it. By the way, I should, um, as you know, Rory, if we get our facts wrong, we always apologise, unlike most of our newspapers. Um, I said last week in the Q&A that the Ed Davey interview, where he was asked the same question 10 times, was with Dan Hewitt. Um, it was with Paul Brand. Oh, Paul must have been pretty cross about that. I don't think he was very cross, but it was actually some of his friends who who told me that, that uh, some of his colleagues told me I'd, I'd messed it up. So I'd sent him a message to apologise. We said he wasn't that bothered, and he said he loves the podcast, so it's all fine. <laughs> um, so question from Catherine. Which plays, which films have we been seeing and enjoying recently? Have we been seeing any films, TV recently? Mm, we went to see Priscilla the other night. Very good. And that's not Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, I understand. It's your friend it's Priscilla, Elvis again. Pris it's Priscilla, wife of Elvis. As a sort of massive Elvis fan, which I am, it's slightly troubling. Oh, um, he wasn't very nice to her, is the revelation, is it? At times he wasn't nice, but he was very, very nice to her when, when they first met. But at the time she was only 14. Oh, mm. um, and then he got her sort of flown out to his to Graceland. And, right. But it's a very kind of nice portrait of her. It's the relationship from her perspective. We also watched Killers of the Flower Moon. Now, we cheated a bit because we didn't watch it in the cinema because I couldn't quite face three and a half hours sitting near people who are eating popcorn and doing other things that should be banned in cinemas. <laughs> so we watched so we watched it in two in two goes on television. Um and, and you my god. It? You'd recommend it? I yeah, I, I mean do you know what? Because Leonardo DiCaprio is sort of seen as this kind of, you know, bit of a sex symbol and all that stuff, he's an incredible actor. Right. Um yeah, I think as a as a as a slice of a very interesting and much misunderstood period of American history. I thought it was pretty impressive. Good. So my my thing is I've just been to see Cabaret at the Kit Kat Club, which is Playhouse Theatre next to Embankment in London. Just incredible. And I hugely recommend it to you. So it's a production where, I mean, I think it, it totally reverses the old complaint about popcorn, which is that it really embraces the idea that the whole audience is turned into a cabaret audience with tables yeah. and drinks on them and nibbles on them. That's different. That's different. And and my uh, Rebecca Lucy Taylor, who plays Sally Bowles, is just extraordinary. And the singing, I mean, I know you love music. The singing is phenomenal. 
but they set the mood right from the moment you enter. Um, it's worth turning up. If you go to see it, worth turning up 15 minutes, half an hour in advance to just catch the ambiance because they've created the sense of a, a 1930s German bar from the beginning. And of course, um, as people know the story, it's it's both incredible music, but also a very, very interesting lesson about the way in which you can feel like a frog in boiling water and convince yourself nothing's going to go wrong. The, yeah. the, the central character who, or one of the central characters who's Jewish says, when the American says, look, shouldn't you be getting out of Germany? He says, no, no, no. Um, I understand the Germans. I am German. Don't worry about it. There's, there's nothing mm. to worry about here. Mm. Very good. Very good. Well, that was what we call a massive plug. Well massive done. plug, massive plug. Yeah. Yeah. Now here's one for you, yep. for, well, for both of us, really. Sam Dyson. How should Keir Starmer handle a potential Trump presidency? Does he take the May Johnson approach, knowing it will hurt him domestically, or does he give Donald the cold shoulder, which could damage the special relationship but would be very popular here in the UK? Oh, what should he do? Should he be polite to him or should he make it clear that he despises him? Um, I think the former. I think it has to be the former. Um, I mean, it's not impossible that these elections are going to happen at the same time. Uh, I can see, look, it, the temptation, this is the whole Love Actually thing when, that scene in the Love Actually when Hugh Grant as Prime Minister sort of does the amazing, stands up to the Americans. Yep. And of course, it's great cinema, but I think it would be very, very, very dangerous politics. But it is tricky. I think it, I think basically all, both the main parties, in a sense, have to, have to stay out uh, of the politics. But it's very, very hard because the truth so is, is... So in, in my my sort of catastrophic attempt to be leader of the Conservative Party in that debate against Boris Johnson. I was asked what um, what I thought about the latest offensive comment by Donald Trump. And I sort of said, well, I think, you know, British prime ministers have to be quite careful getting cool. involved in, in slagging off other world leaders. And we can do things in private, not public. And there were headlines afterwards saying, what is the point of Rory Stewart if he isn't even prepared to come out and attack <laughs> Donald Trump? So I, 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 can, I feel for Keir Starmer here. And, you know, one of the, to add to my list of fury at Boris Johnson, he's just written a Daily Mail article suggesting that, whose least headlines seem to suggest that Trump wouldn't be too bad a thing. And Jacob rees Mogg's now come out saying nice things about yeah. Trump. Yeah. And Andrew, Andrea Jenkins said we need to get Boris and Trump back. I, that's why the other reason, Rory, why I, I feel that um, Johnson's commitment to Ukraine was all about him and not about Ukraine. Anybody who really cares about the future of Ukraine does not want Donald Trump. We're not Trump be talking about Donald Trump, yeah. So Boris Johnson can go stuff himself with that one. I think, look, I think Keir Starmer will just play it very, 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 very down the line and very, very proper. Um, I actually thought his. I, I before we started recording, I, I, I caught his response to to Rishi Sunak, and I, I think he actually is emerging with a bit of a foreign policy defence position, um, which I I would like to see more of. I'd like to see more of foreign because I think the the connecting of foreign policy to domestic policy. I mean, if you think about what we've talked about on the main podcast and on the Q and A this week, so much of of what the British people are talking about actually relates to things that are happening outside this country. Yeah. Well, I mean, Brendan May has got a question on this, which I guess applies to Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer. Why should Western governments continue to prop up Netanyahu when he's confirmed on record that he will reject the only possible path to peace in his region, namely an independent and sovereign Palestinian state and one that doesn't require forced migration of millions? It's a very good, very good question. I am astonished that Keir Starmer hasn't come out yet unambiguously and completely for a ceasefire. I mean, I, I think the, the 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 time for holding off on that has passed so long ago now. Well, he's, I think he has. I mean, he did in that the the the, the comments in the comments that I mentioned. He he he, he, he certainly talks in. The, I think he uses the same language as David Cameron does. The sustainable ceasefire. Yeah, but the sustainable ceasefire, the sustainable bit, when you look into the mm. small print, basically means. You know, it's sustainable when Hamas has disappeared and the hostages have all yeah. been returned, and this and the other. So essentially, it's it's language that works for the Israeli government. It's not really stopping the bombing of Gaza. I I I certainly think that that Netanyahu is he's this is something we suggested might happen, but I think it's happened to to a degree that is worse than either was expected. Netanyahu is basically pocketing the support that he gets wherever it comes from. 
But then in terms of his own approach to this war, he is not budging an inch, I don't think, from the strategy he fixed upon right at the start. That I mentioned in the main podcast, this dispute that's going on between him and Benny Gantz and, other, and, and some of the observers at the, at the War Cabinet. And um, the, the, the guy who, who gave this rather tricky interview for Netanyahu, Eisenkot, he was asked whether he thought that Netanyahu, Netanyahu might just be trying to make this war sort of last as long as he can um, to stay in power. And, you know, you'd have thought, you'd have thought a member of his close, the, t- the guy who tends all these war cabinet meetings, you thought of his answer would have been, no, of course not. He's just representing the national interest and in pursuing the strategy that we've got. Instead of which you just said, I hope not. Yeah. 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 Well, I guess, I mean, I guess Heisenkot's not, not on his side, is he? Aman Perak, is populism condescending? Is the word populism condescending to the average voter? I, I have sometimes felt this. I remember going to a big meeting with one of these grisly international conferences, not Davos this time, back in 2016, and seeing all the great luminaries of Europe, you know, uh, Herman von Rompuy, Mario Monti, Jean-Claude Trichet, all lamenting populism and thinking, really, wait a sec, what's the difference between populism and what voters in a democracy really want? And the best answer I've come up with is that populism isn't really a way of describing doing things that voters want. It, it's a way of describing the leaders, not the voters. It's a way of describing an unbelievable act of cynicism and dishonesty, which is essentially involved in pitting one group against another and offering yeah. very simplistic solutions to complex problems. Exactly. That's that's what I've always thought popular is. Where he's got a point is that once you're having to explain at that kind of length what we define populism as, then you've sort of lost it a little bit. And I think that because populism starts with the first five letters that you have for popular, when populism first started to be discussed kind of universally as a, as part of our politics, it kind of, la- it, it really won the debate in terms of, well, we're doing what the people want and what's wrong with what the people want. And that's what allowed the populists then to say, this is about us, the people against the elite. Um, listen, it's something that I don't think I don't think we, the whatever you want to call us, the sort of, you know, anti-populists, I don't think we've ever really found the right language to deal with this. Yeah. Keith Thomas, who I'm guessing for the surname might be Welsh. Carwin Jones, ex-First Minister of Wales, not unreasonably has asked the question as to why, if net zero is a major contributing factor to the decision of Tata Steel to close Port Talbot, the same is not happening at their plant in the Netherlands or elsewhere in Europe. What are your thoughts? I should commend on this a short film. I think that may be where Keith's question come from, because Carwin Jones was interviewed for this short film by Byline Times, which was analysing the media coverage, BBC, Sky, ITV, GB News, the papers, of the closure of um, the, the steel plant. And the fact that nobody was really trying to analyse why this was being shut, and the ease with which the populist right managed to make it an issue about net zero. What Carolyn Jones said was actually the real problem here and the reason why it wasn't being shut down in Holland is Brexit. Um, and that was the gigantic elephant in the room on the steel industry. And don't forget, it's, it's, it's so Mr. Sad, Farage. It's so sad, isn't it? Because there's a big story here, because I remember this when Sajid Javid was on the hook for this years ago, trying to bring in more emergency support measures and support to try to deal with the British steel industry. I mean, it keeps coming back again and again, isn't it? I mean, and presumably this was something you saw in your time in office, that the whole industrial base of Britain struggles and the government comes in with rescue packages and industrial strategies, but it's never fully working. I mean, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about the DL aluminium plant in Glasgow or whether you're talking about Tata Steel or a lot of the Northeast, we're just losing stuff again and again and again. And it just feels as though it's very difficult to keep these kind of industries going in Britain. Mm. But, you know, but but I, I do think it was incredible. That there were lots and lots and lots of words devoted to this. It was on the news all day. It was all across the newspapers. Um, but the, the success that the sort of pro-Brexit people have had in keeping Brexit out of the debate on massive issues like this. And so, and you had Farage, they're the guy who was on record as saying, if we stay in the European Union, Britain's steel industry will die. Johnson said the same. And Farage, 
you know, straight onto GB News saying this is all about net zero, these crazy plans on net zero. There were interviews with the steelworkers who were saying, you know, we understand we have to transition, but it's how we do the transition. I mean, one of the things the British right, the populist right, are not doing, which you, would be the natural move in the US, is protectionism. I mean, the, the real way that you keep your steel industry alive is you do what Trump did, which is you put massive tariffs on import of other people's steel. What's mm. interesting about the British right is it remains much more free trade than almost any other populist right-wing movement anywhere in the world. That's um, true. Uh, and, and that makes it very, very difficult oddly, to, to, to support an industrial base, hence the sort of Singapore and Thames. Final question for me, um, which is a bit self-serving because it's directed against me. Matt Lucas, in previous discussions around people with backgrounds and highly local politics being thrust into foreign policy, Rory's mentioned the difference between Sunni and Shia Islam being one of the common knowledge gaps. As someone with minimal knowledge, broadly looks like the global sides of the Muslim are splitting along this line with broadly Shia Iran on one side and broadly Sunni Saudi Arabia on the other. Western biases usually make me think of Catholics and Protestants through history. No idea how bad that comparison truly is. Could Rory explain It's that? not bad. It's, it's not, not bad. Not bad is the answer. And actually, um, uh, for more details, and it, Barnaby Rogerson's written a book that's just come out called House Divided, goes right back to the very, very early days of Islam and a split in leadership between the son-in-law and cousin of the Prophet Muhammad uh, and his children, who were killed in the Battle of Karbala, on the one hand. Ali, Ali bin Abu Talib. Very good. And, and Imam Hussein, his son. And on the other side, Yazid and the Sunni line that took over. And this has been sustained through... Oh, it was Abu, Abu Bakr. Very good. Through Muslim history. I've been looking it up too, Rory. Very good. No, I, I haven't had to look <laughs> it up for once in my life. <laughs> Not something I have to look up. Um, but it's it's it's... And of course, as you've pointed out, when you say broadly speaking in the question, I mean, it is it's it is more complicated because there's a huge Shia population in Saudi Arabia. There's a very significant Sunni population in Iran. Mm. Um, and of course, in Afghanistan, the center of the country is dominated by Shia who, in the first time the Taliban were in the 90s, faced almost kind of genocidal attacks from the Sunni Taliban against the Shia Hazara. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I think the the comparison with Catholic Protestant it shouldn't be overdone, but I think where there's where you can see it is they essentially on the sort of you know the big picture of who their God is and believing in that God, they they believe the same things. There are five pillars of Islam, and both Sunni and Shia follow them. And essentially, it was a, it was a debate about who should follow Muhammad when he died in six hundred and thirty something, and the Sunnis believe that. The, the the successor should come from people, as it were, who were capable of doing the job. And that's why Abu Bakr, who was a friend and a close advisor of Muhammad, he, he, got, he, he became the first caliph. And then the Shias, they believe that it should stay in the family uh, of those who've been, uh, 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 been appointed. And at the time, they wanted, uh, as yeah. you say, the and, cousin and, this, and the son-in-law. And they've developed very different sorts of theology. So obviously in, in Iran, as people will know listening to the show, the Ayatollahs, and particularly the, the, the uh, Ayatollah Khamenei, who's the uh, supreme leader, have a very particular position of authority. And maybe in that way, it might remind people a bit of the Catholic Church with more authorities for popes and, and bishops, whereas Sunni Islam is, is flatter. He is, as it were, he is, in a sense, a greater authority than the state because he is seen as infallible in the same way as the Pope is infallible. Well, yes, although there's also a great tradition of debate in Shia Islam. I mean, they sit there and come endlessly debating everything. Um, there's a lovely mm. book, for, if people want to go a bit deeper, called The Mantle of the Prophet by Roy Motahade, which is an amazing account of, uh, I guess, political history and Islam in, in Shia Iran. Um, but it's it's a really really great question, and um, and it, it's it was critical to Iraq because in Iraq Saddam Hussein, who was Sunni, essentially oppressed the Shia who were the majority. The Shia have now come back in, and that's one of the reasons why we now have a much more Iranian friendly Iraq. Anybody wants to learn even more, not only have I recommended Barney B. Rogerson's book, but he's actually interviewed on our sister podcast Empire, where you can hear even more about the difference between Sunni and Shia and what it meant for Iran in particular. If I can add a word about empire, if I hear Fiona Miller, my partner, 
say one more time, God, I love Willie Dalrymple on the Middle East. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think she's committing pedultery. Pedultery, that's what it is. That's it. But anyway, read Barnaby Rogerson's book. Over to you for the last question. My final question, Rory. I think because I think we've been we've been agreeing far too much. Uh, Haley Savage, what does this government have to do that will stop Rory Stewart becoming dewy-eyed when asked who he would vote for in the election? I was shocked that last week he struggled to get past not voting Conservative. Surely he has to want them out if only yep. to save them from themselves. There we are. What a what a great what a great question. What a great question. I'm, I'm, also, I'm sort of envious. Well, I'm always envious of people like Seb Coe who come on the show and then slag off the Conservative Party and then say <laughs> they're going to vote Conservative and they're loyal Tories all the way. And, um, no, yeah, he's I, all right. He can't vote because he's the Lords. Yeah, I'm I'm a I'm a recovering Conservative and I'm I'm still struggling to navigate my way through all of this stuff. Yeah, I don't think you bec- you're not dewy eyed about the Tories, though, are you? I no, I think that's harsh. a bit unfair. I don't think I don't think I don't think my colleagues would describe me as being dewy eyed. No, no. What, but what, what do you think you're going to vote, though? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I'm staying out of that at the moment. I'm, I'm sick of. Well, you can't stay out of it. You're, you're a political figure. Secrecy of the major ballot. platform. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my. Well, on the on that note of this great, open-minded political figure who wants to change the way we do politics. And just, just avoiding the question and refusing to do... How is he going to vote? Refusing to, to give you the headline yeah. you want of me I endorsing think, I, I think, Keir Starmer. I think I'm going to vote Labour. Uh, you might might just. might just. You might, so. might still be supporting Burnley next year. You never know. I'll definitely be doing that. I'll definitely <laughs> be doing that. Very good. All right. All right, Rory. Let's Love wrap. to talk as ever. Thank All you very best. much. Bye. Bye.